Okay. Uh, so it's uh, welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure to have Rogerio Ferris uh, with us today. Uh, he is a principal scientist and a manager at the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. Uh, he actually joined an IBM uh, quite uh, quite some time ago in 2006. So he's been with IBM, I guess, for 15 years um, after receiving his PhD from uh, UC Santa Barbara. And he also worked as an affiliate associate professor at the University of Washington, as well as an adjunct uh, professor at Columbia University. He's done uh, all sorts of really interesting work on a variety of topics, which I can't put in a couple of sentences. So I'm not even going to try, but he's done uh, enormous amount of work over this period of time. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have him here. Uh, he mentioned that you can ask questions as he goes. So I'll monitor the chat. And uh, if there's anything that comes up, then I will pop this up. Thanks, Rogerio, and welcome. I think, thank you so much, uh, Dion. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. It's a great honor for me to be giving a talk uh, at UBC uh, virtually. And in this talk, I'll be covering some of the work that my team is doing on methods that adaptively change computation depending on the input. So we'll start with some early work that we did uh, for efficient inference. And then I'll move towards more recent work on multitask learning and synthetic uh, pre-training data generation, which I'm excited about. All right, so as you know, the traditional approach for deep learning is based on hierarchical feed-forward neural networks, where you have earlier layers that capture low-level features like the board filters and so on, and um, layers that are close to the prediction, the decision level, which capture more semantic uh, content. Now, all of these approaches, they basically rely mostly on a single path where the exact same set of features they are extracted for all inputs. Now, what happens when we drop a layer of a neural network at this time? And, and here by dropping a layer, I mean uh, taking the output of the previous layer and passing directly to the next layer. Now, Andreas Veit and colleagues, they have an interesting paper at NeurIPS in 2016 where they did this test. They took uh, the CIFAR-10 uh, data set and they basically dropped a layer from the VGG network. And what happens is that for VGG, the performance as you drop a layer is very poor, close to random chance. However, if you drop a layer from a residual network, nothing happens except for a few peaks here from the downsampling layers, as you can see. And that's true also for other multi-path architectures like DenseNet, ResNext, and so on. Why does this happen? So you can see here in the left, you have a VGG model, which is based on a single path, whereas the ResNet model on the right, it has all these skip connections. Now, if you unroll the recursion in the ResNet model, you can see that it consists of multiple paths. And in fact, the new RIPS paper that I mentioned basically argues that residual networks, they behave like ensembles of shallow learners, where the shadow learners here are basically these different paths of the network. Now, if we drop a layer in VGG, or ResNet. For VGG, all paths, they are affected. Whereas for a residual network, only half of the paths are affected. Now it's also interesting that, you know, as you drop, you know, a sequence of layers, the performance varies smoothly, meaning, so here you're having the X, X is the number of layers deleted. So now we are not deleting just one single layer, but a sequence of layers. And then on the Y axis, you have the error. And you can see that the error increases smoothly, but it still increases as you drop more layers. Now the question is, can we delete a sequence of layers without performance drop? And this would be very important for applications where, you know, fast inference is essential. So, you know, when you drop layers at test time, 
then you are decreasing the computational expense of running the model. And that's important for applications like autonomous driving, robotics, cell phone uh, applications, and, and, and so on. Now, it's interesting that in the experiment that I showed you based on this paper by Andreas Veit and colleagues, the way that they dropped layers was in a random way. So basically layers were dropped randomly anywhere in the network. And also the same layers were dropped for all the images. So you thought this could be the reason why the error, you know, still increases as you, in, as you drop more layers. So we investigated this problem, you know, in, in a paper that we published a few years ago at CDPR uh, called Block Drop, Dynamic Inference Paths in Residual Networks. So the idea of this work is basically to design a model, which we call a policy network that takes an input image and predicts which layers or blocks of layers of a residual network you should execute and which layers you could drop in order to you know, maximize this accuracy efficiency trade-off. So this is a collaboration with uh, Zushuan Wu, Tushar Nagarajan, Abhishek Kumar, Steve Rennie, Larry Davis, and, and Kristen Brown. So the motivation for this work is, do we really need to run 100 plus layers or residual blocks of a neural network, which is very expensive for images that are easy. For example, this you know, image of a dog where you have a very clear frontal view, you know, very clean background. So kind of an easy image that we need to run all these layers of a residual network. As I mentioned, if you drop some blocks during testing, performance does not hurt much. Now, the question is, how do we determine which blocks to drop depending on the input image? So if you take these images of dogs, which are easy images with clean background, frontal views, and so on, you would expect to drop more blocks while you know, predicting, um, making the correct prediction for the network. Now, if you have images that are more complex, for example, these dogs, and, and actually some of them are actually bagels, um, you would expect that you would need more computation and less blocks to be dropped for making a correct prediction. So this is our block drop idea. So we want to predict which blocks of layers and residual blocks to drop condition on the input image in just one single shot without compromising accuracy. So we achieved this by designing this very lightweight policy network. So this policy network you know, could consist, let's say, of you know, three residual blocks where uh, the computational expense would be negligible compared to the full backbone. So this policy network basically takes an input image and then predicts you know, for each one of the layers or residual blocks, which ones should be executed and which ones should be dropped. So basically the output is this binary vector of you know, ones and zeros indicating which blocks of the network should be executed for a given input image. Now, how do we train this policy network? So these decisions of you know, keep drop, keep drop, they are actually discrete. So using standard backpropagation here is not so easy. So we rely on policy gradients for that. So given an input training image, we basically run through the policy network. We get these block drop trajectories indicating which blocks should be executed and which ones should be dropped. And then at the end, at the prediction level, we make a prediction and we get a reward. Now the, the reward, is actually a dual reward. So we want to, one, maximize accuracy. We want to make correct predictions. But at the same time, we want to take into account block usage, meaning we would like to you know, drop as much blocks as possible 
you know, to make a correct prediction in order to maximize efficiency as well. So we have this dual reward, which I'll go into more details uh, next. And once we have that, you know, this is basically used, you know, to update the policy network using policy gradients, and we train the policy network in this way. Um, you know, after the policy network is trained, we also fine tune the main backbone, the residual network um, model jointly with the policy network. So this is similar to reinforcement learning, but actually it's more like a contextual bandit problem where we have new states. So given an input image, the policy network will, you know, make these predictions of keep drop in a single shot directly without uh, states. A little more details about the reward function. So as I said, given an input image, we compute this trajectory of you know, block drop predictions. And at the end, based on the executed blocks, we make a prediction. Now, if for the input image, we make a correct prediction, let's say a dog in this case, then the reward is computed as one minus the percentage of executed blocks squared. So in this example, we have eight blocks that were executed by this vector u, and we have a total of 16 blocks. So by computing the reward for this case, we get 0.75. Now, let's say that we make an incorrect prediction. Let's say that we produce, you know, as prediction, a cat for this dog image. In this case, the reward is just this negative constant value, gamma. And uh, this gamma value basically allows us also to control the operating point of the model uh, in the sense that we can, you know, control the trade-off between accuracy and efficiency. So here are results on ImageNet. So we are able to save about 20 to 36% com uh, uh, computation in terms of flops. And we have compared with several other uh, adaptive uh, computation methods. And the, the, the key here is that this method is complementary to other model compression techniques, for example, pruning and, and quantization. And that could be potentially used in tandem um, with these techniques as well. So it's interesting to see that the block drop policies, they actually capture different visual patterns. So if you take this pile of oranges, they, all, all, all of these images of pile of oranges, they will follow the exact same path, uh, this config one, which is different from you know, the path that is followed by these close up oranges or these sliced oranges in the bottom. And also the block usage in general, it agrees with our perception of difficulty. So if you take um, the top images, they are kind of considered easy images. So you have objects, you know, like usually a single object um, in a clean background and so on. And for those images, our method actually, you know, selects less blocks to be executed. So more blocks are dropped. Whereas for the, images in, in the bottom, which are considered hard. So you have more objects, you have more occlusions, you have more cluttered background. Um, then in, in this case, usually our method, you know, um, selects more blocks to be executed and less blocks to be dropped. Okay, so now let me describe how we extended uh, this block drop approach uh, in order to do multi-task learning. So here the idea is to minimize uh, negative interference. So we would like to maximize accuracy of all tasks in a joint model. And at the same time, we would like to um, minimize the number of parameters of the model. And this is work that was published at New Rips 2020 and it's joint work with Simeng San, Ramesh Orpenda, and, and Kate Sain. 
So as you know, the traditional approach for um, multitask learning is hard parameter sharing. So we have basically a unified model where all the initial layers, they are shared among all, all tasks. And then at some point we branch out and we have task specific layers and a specific decision you know, for uh, each task. Now, the key issue with this approach is you know, determining where should we branch in the network and you know, how much capacity should we allocate to each task. And, and the, there is a very large and combinatorially large space of configurations in terms of branching and number of layers for each task and so on. In fact, th there is a paper by Ishan Mishra where he enumerated you know, very different configurations of branching configurations for these multi-task models. And it turns out that um, you know, the, the, the ones that lead to highest accuracy, um, they actually are unusual you know, branching architectures that are very different to arrive by just doing manual exploration. So you know, the space of possible branching architectures is combinatorially large. And um, because of that, manual search is just infeasible. Now, more recently, soft parameter sharing approaches have become, you know, more popular. And the idea here is that uh, you have a separate backbone for each task. So as you add a new task, you add a new backbone, but these backbones, they are allowed to interact. So they, there is exchange of information across the layers of these different um, backbones. And despite the fact that these approaches, they uh, do get better accuracy, there is a problem that, again, for each new task, you need to add a new backbone, and that increases the number of parameters dramatically. So the number of parameters, they grow linearly with the number of tasks. So this is the problem that we uh, are addressing. Can we determine which layers in the network should be shared across which tasks and which layer should be task specific so that we achieve you know, the best accuracy and memory um, footprint trade-off? So here the point is that some tasks you know, they like each other and uh, sharing features, they benefit both tasks. But other tasks, they may just not like each other. And when you share features across them, then performance go down. That's negative uh, interference. So we would like to find, you know, the best sharing scheme as possible. And at the same time, reduce the number of parameters compared to soft um, parameter sharing approaches. So in order to address this problem, we proposed an approach that we call Ada share. So the idea here is that we have a single backbone. So instead of having multiple backbones as in the soft sharing parameter approach, we have just a single backbone. And the key idea is that we have a different computational path for each task. So in this example here, we have two tasks. And if you look, at the network here, we have the two um, first blocks of the network of layers, which are in orange. They are shared across tasks, across the two tasks. The next one, the third block, is specific to task two. Then the fourth one is specific to task one. And then the next block is actually skipped by both tasks. And we allow that just, you know, like block drop, you know, it could skip the block you know, for, for both or all tasks. So this is what we want to solve. You want to you know, determine which tasks should be shared, like in the two first blocks, which tasks should be independent to minimize um, negative interference for some of the blocks, like the third one, and um, you know, which blocks should be skipped for all tasks. So that's the, the key idea of our approach, where each task follows 
a different execution path. So this is related to block drop, but has important differences. So in block drop, we are doing per instance routing. So for each image, we do the routing, where in other share, we do per task routing. So the routing is done per task. Another difference is that in block drop, we have both an accuracy and sparsity reward, the dual rewards that I mentioned before. Whereas for error share, we not only have a reward for accuracy and sparsity, but we also have a sharing reward, which basically encourages you know, to have these drop locations to coincide among tasks so that you can maximize sharing. And this is important specifically for earlier layers where you can share and reuse computation. Okay, so here are more details of our uh, approach. So different from block drop, we don't have a policy network. So we basically optimize directly for the task logics. So by that, I mean that each task here has a vector, which basically is the size, you know, the number of layers or residual blocks. And each value in this uh, vector basically encodes the likelihood that, you know, that specific task will use that specific block or layer in the network. So we will execute that block. So we basically optimize for this vector and we sample from this vector distribution using gamble softmax sampling, which allows us to basically define for each task, which blocks of layers each task should be should execute. And as I mentioned before, we have this sharing loss and sparsity loss. Now, if you see the compact view on the top, as we determine these different computational paths for each task, you can see that you know, some tasks, they will share um, the same block of layer, other blocks of layers will be, you know, uh, executed just for a single task, uh, and they are task specific. And there will be blocks that will be skipped, you know, for all tasks. We also have a loss function that encourages the accuracy of, you know, the each one of the tasks. For example, in this case, we have semantic segmentation and surface normal. We would have a cross entropy loss and a cosine singularity loss. And it's important to mention that um, you know, the optimization of the task logics and uh, the backbone parameters, they are done jointly uh, using an alternate optimization scheme. So let me go over some of the experimental results. So we started with um, the Cityscapes uh, data set, which contains two tasks, uh, semant semantic segmentation and uh, depth uh, prediction. And uh, we consider different baselines. So we have a single task baseline where we basically train, you know, an independent separate backbone for each task. So these are trained independently. Then we have the multi-task uh, baseline, which basically consists of, you know, all sharing. So it's basically the hard parameter sharing that I mentioned where we have all layers shares across all tasks, except for the uh, end where we have specific task um, heads. And then we have several other state-of-the-art methods based on soft parameter sharing, like cross-stitch uh, networks, as Lewis, and DDR, and M10. And other share achieves you know, the best performance across these methods on five out of seven uh, metrics using less than uh, uh, half of the parameters of most uh, baselines. And you can see here uh, in, the, in the bottom, uh, we have this policy visualization, which basically, you know, like you, you can see the tone of red. So you, you have semantic segmentation on top and left prediction uh, in, in the bottom row. And, and the tone of red basically encodes the likelihood that that task is using that specific uh, block 
index, residual block index in the network. Uh, and, and you can see that, you know, this, this is actually hard to achieve by just manual um, exploration. Uh, we, we get very unusual uh, branching schemes uh, from this approach. So we also test on NY2 V2, uh, considering three tasks. And uh, Adashair achieves the best performance on 10 out of 12 metrics using less than one third of the parameters of you know, most baselines. And also we tested on tiny test economy with uh, five tasks. And um, in this case, we get, um, uh, we all perform the baselines on three out of the five tasks using five times less parameters. Again, you know, for all, you know, this soft sharing approach, you would have for five tasks, you would have, you know, five different backbones, where here we, we have just one single uh, backbone that, that can accommodate all tasks. Okay, so, so far I have described methods that rely on instance uh, specific computational paths and task specific computational paths for both efficient, efficient inference and uh, multitask learning. I'll now show how these techniques can be extended on the data side. So the idea of this method, which we call task to sim, is to adaptively select simulation parameters like lighting, pose, background, and so on, in order to generate synthetic pre-trained data sets for each task. So this is joint work with Samarth uh, Mishra, Rameswar Penda, Cheng Fu, Leonid Karlinski, Kate Saenko, and Venkatesh Saligurama. So as you know, the status quo in visual recognition is to pre-train models from massive data sets. And that could include label data like ImageNet pre-training or uh, unlabeled or weekly labeled data like um, Google JFT 3 billion, Instagram 3.5 billion, and, and so on. And the key recipe you know, for achieving better accuracy in most cases is you know, to rely on large scale pre-training. So like the best results that I know, you know in ImageNet, uh, the top one accuracy is using a training data set of 3 billion images, which are weekly labeled uh, with a transformer model of 2 billion parameters. And uh, that leads to 90% of one accuracy um, in uh, ImageNet, which is quite impressive. But despite this accuracy improvement, this large scale pre-training comes with uh, shortcomings. First, the expensive curation. As you know, labeling data is tedious, is costly. And uh, not only that, uh, we have data sets like Google JFT or Instagram 3 billion. These are proprietary data sets. So we have great pre-trained models, but we cannot access the data. And there are also other concerns like privacy and human bias and issues with uh, usage rights, and copyright. So a promising way to address these issues is to rely on synthetic data. And as you know, there is a long history of research in training with synthetic data. Um, but more recently, this area has you know, received a lot of attention, especially you know, um, based on emerging applications like embodied perception, uh, autonomous driving, face simulation, and, and, and so on. This is a plot by Gartner, where they predict that by 2030, synthetic data will completely overshadow real data in AI models. Uh, so here you have in the x-axis the time and the y-axis the data used for AI, and you can see that synthetic data you know, is exponentially increasing. Uh, this is their prediction. It might not be true, but the fact is that um, I, I do think the synthetic data will uh, receive more and more attention, especially with, you know, many of tech companies investing in virtual reality, virtual worlds, and, and so on. Now, when we deal with 
synthetic data, one of the key problems is this uh, reality gap, which is the discrepancy between the real world and you know, the simulation. And there has been a lot of works on domain adaptation you know, to bridge this gap. However, all of these works, they assume the same label set for you know, the source and the target domain. Instead, the, the problem that we are focusing on is actually representational learning from synthetic pre-training. So we basically pre-train a model on synthetic data, and then we transfer this model to downstream tasks from various domains. So medical, sketch, flowers, digits, satellite. And to my knowledge, this problem has not been um, sufficiently uh, studied. Now, as we started playing with this problem, we realized that different simulation parameters as we pre-train synthetic models, like you know, the lighting, the background, and so on, they have different effects on different downstream tasks. So if you see this table, we have on the left the pre-training data variations. So we start with you know, just pose variation, then we add lighting and build a new pre-trained model, then we add blur and build a new protein model and, and, and so on. And then on the right, we have the downstream task accuracy. So we have several examples of downstream tasks covering different domains, like satellite, digits, sketch, and texture, DTD. So when you, we take you know, these models pre-trained on synthetic data, we have noticed that, for example, when you add blur, when you transfer to Euroset, performance increases from 88 to 90. For SVHN, performance increases as well. But for Sketch, performance decreases. And for DTD, performance decreases. When you add materials, performance decreases for Euroset, whereas for SVHN, performance increases. And it decreases for Sketch and increases for DTD. So the point here is that, you know, these different simulation parameters, as we pre-train different models from synthetic data, they have different effects in different downstream tests. So motivated by this observation, we proposed an approach which is called task to scene, where the idea is to have a unified model that maps task representations to simulation parameters. And these simulation parameters can then be used to generate pre-trained data sets for these tasks. So that's the key idea. And this is similar in some sense to both block drop and other share. But here, instead of dropping layers, we are actually selecting which simulation parameter we should use for each task to generate pre-trained data sets. So more specifically, if you see on the left here, we have a batch of tasks. And by tasks here, you could consider, say, image classification problems of different domains. So we have task one, medical imaging, task two, uh, sketch, and, and, and so on. The first step is to take these tasks and map them to a feature embedding. And, and here we, we're using task to vec embeddings. So basically here we have a vector for each task which represents each task. Now we take these vectors and we feed into our task to scene model, which as I said, will map these task representations to simulation parameters. So basically it will decide which parameters better suit the task. Once you have these parameters, then we have the generator. And in this case, we are using this platform from MIT uh, the 3D world uh, or TDW to basically you know, generate the synthetic image data sets per task. Once the synthetic image data sets are generated, then you can pre-train a model on these data sets and then fine tune them on the downstream tasks. Now the reward here is actually the accuracy from the downstream tasks. So the idea is that we you know, optimize for transfer learning performance. And then based on this reward, which is based on accuracy, we update the parameters 
of our model, similar to how we did in block drop using um, policy gradients. Now, the, the interesting aspect is that we, by, by doing this approach, we, we not only determine the optimal, in, in quotes, parameters, simulation parameters and pre-trained data sets for these tasks that we are trained, but the model can also handle unseen tasks where we would just map the unseen task to a task to vac embedding, and then we would run task to seen to generate in one shot the pre-trained data set for that specific task without requiring additional training. So that's a, a, a nice uh, aspect that, that is, I, I'd say would be very useful in, in, in practice. So here I'm showing the parameters that we considered. Uh, so as part of TDW, we can you know, change object rotation, the camera distance, the blur amount, uh, different background. We also considered uh, light intensity, uh, light direction, light color, and also varying the, the materials of the objects uh, in order to generate this pre-trained data sets. So our experiments consist of 20 downstream tasks from various domains. So we have natural images like flowers, satellite imagery like Eurosat, symbolic data sets like Omniblot, um, medical data sets like iSeq, which is you know, skin cancer, uh, illustrative like sketch uh, and texture like DTD, which is describable textures in the wild. So we use 12 of these data sets as seen tasks that we use you know, for training and eight data sets for unseen tasks in the mode that I explained before. So here are the results for uh, scene tasks. Uh, I want to point out that we are using 237 classes and 100K uh, images. Um, so basically the 3D world data set, as of now it contains 237 classes. So we are working on extending you know, this number of classes, but that's you know, the number that, that we have uh, right now. And therefore we uh, retrained an ImageNet model using also 237 classes just for you know, a fair comp comparison. And the baselines that we consider is training from scratch, uh, random. So random here means uh, just randomly choosing parameters. So instead of having tasks to seem optimally predicting uh, simulation parameters, here we would just randomly decide which parameters to use. Domain randomization means enabling all parameters. So we consider all variations um, that are available in order to do pre-training. And then we have this specific version of ImageNet. And uh, the, the main conclusion here is that task to scene is you know, competitive with ImageNet and significantly outperforms these other uh, baselines for this budget uh, of training images. You can see in the x-axis are these different data sets of scene tasks, and the y-axis here is the downstream accuracy. We have also uh, done this analysis for unseen tasks. So in the x-axis here, we have these eight unseen tasks. And again, the y-axis is the downstream uh, accuracy. And again, here, the conclusion is the same, where we get competitive results with uh, ImageNet. Um, at the same time, outperforming uh, the other baselines. And the key advantage of the unseen tasks is that we don't need to retrain again the model. We can do that uh, in one shot. And we are currently extending you know, the number of classes so that we could do more large scale uh, experiments, also with more mesh models uh, per class. So let me just Briefly, before uh, concluding, you know, just cover some of the next steps that we are currently working on along this line um, of, you know, leveraging synthetic data for pre-training. So the, the way that we see uh, the, the field evolving is we, we got 
in 2012, this breakthrough with ImageNet and, and then pre-training from ImageNet became the go-to approach. So pre-training from labeled data. Today, there is a lot of excitement about self-supervised learning, which means pre-training with unlabeled data. But as I mentioned before, you know, this approach still has issues regarding privacy, ethical concerns, human bias, and, and so on. We do think that pre-training from synthetic images is the next um, you know, key direction for which you know, we still need um, more progress in order to you know, get accuracies that could be potentially similar to large scale data sets like GFT and uh, Instagram 3 billion. And you know, th there is still a problem here where there is a cost of you know, generating models and, and, and synthetic data. Uh, and we, we are also collaborating with MIT on, on pre-training from fractals and noise processes where, you know, here we wouldn't have, you know, any, uh, you know, real images at all. And you could generate these images, for example, from short codes, which would be quite efficiently. And um, in terms of, you know, generation of images, it would be, much less costly as well. We are also exploring multimodal learning from synthetic data. And uh, here you can see all, all, all these images, they are actually synthetic images. And um, you can see, for example, the first one, we have how many chairs are in the room. And the, the nice aspect here is that we could change the number of chairs and create much more training data. Or what, what is the color uh, uh, what color is the, the bed cover? You could potentially change that. Or is there a teddy bear on top of the table? Uh, you could remove the teddy bear and, and, and so on. So we are exploring you know, this multimodal, learn, multimodal learning approach for visual question answering and also for learning representations from multimodal data. So just to summarize, um, I presented um, initially block drop, which basically consists of instance specific computational pathways, where the goal here is to maximize efficiency while not degrading accuracy. Then I showed that this approach can be extended um, for multi-task learning, and I described other share, which consists of task specific computational pathways where the idea is that for each task, we have a different uh, computational path, and that allows us to better handle negative interference, and at the same time, reduce the number of parameters of the model compared to other soft sharing approaches. And finally, I described how this idea could be extended to work on the data uh, aspect, where we have Task specific data simulation pathways, where the goal here is to adaptively select simulation parameters so that we could generate pre training data sets that are task dependent in order to maximize transfer learning performance. So, here are the references for, for this work. Um, and uh, you can also check my website where we have you know, several other works related to dynamic um, computation um, as well as other areas. Um, so again, um, thank you so much for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you, Rogeria. Great, thank you so much. I guess I'll I'll ask a. 
I guess a technical one. So in the, in the original first paper that you presented, you did uh, there was a reinforcement learning based formulation, and then I think the second one was um, used this gimbal softmax, right? The, to to choose uh, to choose which uh, which blocks to execute. Um, do you, uh, yeah, I mean, is there any sort of learning in terms of preference between those two kind of classes of mo models? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Uh, I, I I would say the gimbal softmax approach is much easier to train uh, and also much faster as well. Um, and and yeah, that, that's why we you know ended up choosing it you know for. Um, you know, the, the multi-task learning uh, approach. Um, yeah, so, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the implementation itself, um, I would say Gumball Softmax appro approach is, you know, it's it's much easier. And, you know, specifically for the multi-task one, uh, we, we, we actually don't have a policy network, you know, as, as we have in um, block drop. So we, you know, optimize directly for the policy logics, right? And, um, you know, we just do Gamble Softmax sampling uh, to sample the computational paths uh, of each task. But just to summarize, you know, the, the answer, uh, Leon, I, I, I would say, you know, we, we with RL, you know, it, it takes more time, right, to, to train. And it's also widely to train. Like you, you have all you know these things like uh, you know controlling the, the exploration and and, and 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 so on. And whereas we we we, we felt that with you know Gamble Softmax sampling, um, it, it was easier to train and, and less expensive. Great, that's good. Thanks, uh, Jim. Hi, uh, Rogerio. Wonderful talk. Lots of interesting topics that uh, I wish I'd explored myself too. The uh, I've always, because I did, I've done robotics, I've always been interested in tasks because I always thought computer vision really needed tasks other than saying, there's a dog. Uh, you know, actually, <laughs> there's uh, much to be gained by studying about tasks. Uh, so I think that's cool. It's, it's, it's really interesting because I, I love what you talked about the embodied intelligence. I think that's where a lot of the synthetic data will work out uh, really well, I suspect. Except, um, I, you know, just looking at it, I wonder, those are the cleanest houses I've ever seen. That, that robot walks around in houses that are uncluttered. Uh, and by the same token, yeah, uh, realism in some parts of the, um, uh, of the synthetic data, it's gonna be pretty hard to acquire. Uh, uh, the other side of it, of course, is looking at human motion and human activities. Um, it's hard. It's hard to model what's going on there. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think I think one thought that I have is: Do, do we really need photorealism for you know mm -hmm. for, for getting stronger representations? Right. Like our ultimate goal is, you know, is not photorealism per se, but it's really to get a very strong representation that can transfer well to multiple tasks. Right. And uh, what what we've seen is that. You know, when, when you have even data that is not photorealistic, but you make the, the data more difficult, right? So you, you increase the number of parameters, include blur and, 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 and so on, and make those tasks more difficult to, to decrease, you, you get better, uh, better representations. So I think th th there is a question here whether, you know, photorealism is really necessary, but, but I do agree with you that uh, there is a cost associated Right with um, you know building these models. For example, we, we are limited by these 237 you know classes from 3DW, and there is not a lot of mesh model there, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's one of the motivations that we are kind of starting to explore. Uh, you know, pre-training from structured noise, uh, where you know you take uh, or, or or these shaders where you know, you could generate images even with, you know, short codes. Um, and, you know, the images, they are very different from, you know, they, they are not real images. They are just, they may just match the statistics of natural images, uh, but it's still, they might have, you know, enough signal to learn powerful representations that could, you know, eventually 
I'd say, be you know competitive or even beat real uh, representations based, based on real world data. Yeah, I, I really like the fact that you're indicating what quality of data you need is very uh, much dependent upon the task that you're doing. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. Great stuff. Thank you. Any other questions? Everybody is being quiet. <laughs> okay. Um, in that case, let's let's thank Rogerio. Rogerio, thanks a lot for coming and giving this talk. Yeah, Hopefully, at some nice. point we'll have you over in person. But for now, it's uh, it's all virtual. Yeah, thank you so much. I really really appreciate the invitation. Uh, yeah, very honored to talk to you guys. Thank you. Thank. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.